Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm Nick Weir. I'm a data scientist at Cosmic Works and a ch uh, challenge manager at SpaceNet. Uh, but before I get into what SpaceNet is and how we're trying to enable AI assisted mapping, I want to talk a little bit about why we need machine learning and AI assisted mapping um, and what some of the barriers are to making this happen. So um, the use case that, OK, great, my pointer stopped working right when I started talking. There we go. Um, so why do we need uh, machine learning involved in mapping? Uh, the primary uh, use case is to try to accelerate or broaden the scale of mapping uh, applications. And the case that we always point to is disaster response, where uh, in cases like after Hurricane Maria, it took volunteer mappers uh, over two months to generate the new uh, base map that was used by FEMA for aid distribution. And this is not by any means a knock on the volunteer mappers who are involved in this process. Uh, the, there were almost a million building footprints that had to be relabeled and over 30,000 kilometers of roads that needed to be relabeled. And this is a huge task. And if we could reduce this uh, burden to some degree by using machine learning to generate a first pass or enable the workflow somehow, uh, then we may be able to accelerate the time uh, that it takes to get base maps into the hands of first responders. And so along with accelerating map feature uh, relabeling, we may also be able to broaden foundational map coverage if we can use machine learning. There are some areas where there aren't a ton of volunteer mappers, and if we can uh, reduce the amounts of volunteer or validator work that it would take to uh, map new areas, we may be able to broaden uh, map coverage. And uh, yeah, and reducing burden on volunteer mappers through that. But of course, there are major barriers at, at present to using machine learning for, uh, for generating map feature labels. Um, the, the biggest one, in my opinion, is uh, that there, there's kind of a disconnect between mappers or uh, geospatial experts and machine learning practitioners or computer vision experts right now. Uh, the, there are very few computer vision experts with some familiarity with geospatial challenges and uh, vice versa. And this makes it really hard to scope projects, understand what the limits are uh, to machine learning algorithms and, and how well they might perform at a task and understand what the geospatial specific challenges are uh, that algorithms may need to address. And in addition, there aren't really good, well-established uh, metrics that get used to assess how well algorithms perform for mapping. And this is a problem because you, uh, as a mapper, as someone, or a validator, or someone running a mapping project, you really want to understand how good the product coming out of the algorithm actually is going to be. Because you don't want to end up in a case uh, such as is pointed out on the bottom right here, where uh, you have to do a ton of remapping because the labels just weren't good enough, or a ton of validation work um, in order to clean everything up. And this has happened in a few cases in the past. And so there are a few things that we can do to try to overcome these barriers that are listed here on the right. Um, for the case of managing uh, this kind of disconnect between geo and uh, AI practitioners, we can do things like provide uh, some easy ways for people who are experts in uh, geo to work with machine learning tools and some ways to make it a lot easier for machine learning practitioners to get their hands on and get working with geospatial data. Um, it would be great if we could create, codify, and standardize metrics for AI model performance so that uh, we have this consistent set of scores that get reported for how well a model that, say, is supposed to generate building footprints or, gener or uh, create road network labels is performing so that then uh, when, when these get reported, these have some meaning to the mappers or the, the map project managers uh, in, in terms of how well it's actually going to work. And to avoid the fact that we have tons of revalidation uh, or remapping that may need to get done, it would be fantastic to have kind of benchmark data sets that mapping tools or machine learning tools uh, get applied to um, before you start a whole mapping project so that you can test your algorithm out in this smaller scale kind of 
where uh, data set where you already have really good labels. Uh, so you have something good to compare against. So you really know how well the algorithm is going to perform, what the drawbacks are likely to be, um, and uh, what you're going to need to do afterward in terms of manual remapping, validation, et cetera. So these three things on the right are uh, things that we're trying to address in the SpaceNet partnership. And uh, I would love feedback later on if you think you know, these barriers and these solutions are on, on track or not, um, and if you think we're really hitting, hitting these challenges with SpaceNet. So what is SpaceNet? So it's a nonprofit LLC managed by Cosmic Works, which is a, an applied research lab. Um, and it's... Uh, dedicated to accelerating open source uh, applied research and machine learning, specifically for geospatial applications, primarily for foundational mapping. So it's a partnership that's run by Cosmic and um, also includes Maxar, Amazon Web Services, and the Intel AI Lab. And for this year, we just added two new partners, Capella Space, which is a synthetic aperture radar company, and Topcoder. So, what does SpaceNet do and how do we work? So we have kind of four main pillars. We generate data sets that include high quality, very high resolution satellite imagery, uh, which is then totally open sourced. And along with this imagery, we have map feature labels, so building footprints and road network labels at this point, which are generated by expert labelers. Um, and that's part of, part of what SpaceNet does is pay to get this labeling done and do the QAQC. Um, when we generate these data sets, we run uh, data science coding challenges where we provide participants with some of this imagery and some labels and say, what's the best algorithm that you can generate to identify where road networks or building footprints or something like this are in this data set? And they develop these algorithms. They uh, submit them over the course of these challenges, which we run on TopCoder. Um, and then we take these algorithms and score how well they perform on imagery that they've never seen before. Uh, and so this allows us to really assess how well these algorithms work to identify building footprints, road networks, et cetera. And at the end of the challenges, we open source these algorithms uh, and provide the code for them freely available online uh, for people to use. And uh, I'm going to get to the software tool stuff a little bit later. It's uh, something that um, we've worked a little bit more on uh, within Cosmic than uh, the through the SpaceNet partnership, but I will get uh, to that in a little bit. So what are these uh, data sets that we generate in SpaceNet? So thus far, we have 10 uh, cities that we have imagery of, uh, and this is all uh, Maxar Worldview 2 or Worldview 3 satellite imagery, so it's 0.3 to uh, 0.5 meter resolution. And we have uh, nine cities that we've announced uh, that we have imagery of, and then one that we're currently holding back as part of the, the current SpaceNet challenge that's running, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And you can see we really have pretty global coverage of uh, where these cities are. So we get a lot of different types of geographies, which is really important for developing algorithms. You don't want a whole bunch of US cities uh, um, in your training data set and then be trying to identify buildings somewhere like Khartoum. Uh, we also now, in the most, starting with the most recent challenge, have uh, some different seasonality. The imagery that we have of Moscow is taken in the middle of the winter, so it's really snowy, uh, which is a whole other challenge that we're excited to see how algorithms handle. And so along with the imagery, as I mentioned, we have these uh, very well curated, hand labeled building footprints and road network labels. And these are all vector formatted uh, labels that we open source along with these challenges. Um, so at this point, we have about 800,000 building footprints across, um, across six of the 10 cities that we have. And we have about, I think, 14,000 kilometers of uh, road network labels with these data sets. And so we've run four challenges to date. We're in the process of doing a fifth one. And as I mentioned before, these are mostly centered around, um, around building uh, footprints and road network extraction. So the uh, building footprint challenges have covered uh, so far six of these different cities, including the most recent one that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, where we were exploring uh, identification of building footprints, not only in imagery 
looking straight down, but at a substantial look angle. And the current challenge that we're running is looking at identifying road networks um, for routing purposes, along with getting some travel time estimates. So I'm going to focus now a little bit on uh, the SpaceNet 4 challenge that, um, that, I ran, that we ran and that I was the challenge manager for, uh, where we were looking for participants to identify building footprints in a lot of different look angles. So why did we do this? So um, particularly in disaster response scenarios or any other urgent, urgent collection scenario, uh, the first image that you get of an area of interest is often not at Nader because you don't have time to wait for the satellite to get to be directly overhead. And uh, imagery that's not at Nader, such as this image uh, of the Daiichi power plants in Fukushima, Japan, right after the earthquake, um, has a lot have a has a lot of specific challenges associated with it. You can have a lot of shadows. It's probably pretty hard to see in this image in uh, on the right there. But there are buildings there. There are some suburban homes that are pretty occluded in shadow. Uh, the building footprints can be a bit displaced. Some things may be obscured by tall structures, and resolution goes down when you're looking at it look at an angle. And so. Uh, what the question we were trying to ask is, can machine learning algorithms still find things like buildings and in imagery that's taken at a substantial angle? Or how close to a nadir does an image need to be taken at for you to be able to do uh, building footprint extraction or something like this, which is, of course, important for disaster response? And so the data set had 27 collects over Atlanta from a single pass of a satellite over the city, the Worldview 2 satellite from Maxar. Um, and so uh, there's really no change in lighting or in any other conditions on the ground uh, for most of the features. But you have really substantial variation in the appearance of the image, as you can see in this uh, middle GIF that's running here. Um, and so along with this, we had about 125,000 building footprints that were labeled in the most nadir look, so actual geospatially accurate building footprint labels. Um, and this covered urban, suburban, industrial, et cetera, uh, areas. So there's pretty substantial uh, heterogeneity in the types of geography, although it is all just around Atlanta. Um, we also have road network labels with this data set. We didn't use that in this challenge. And so at the end of the challenge, we open source the top five uh, participant solutions. Um, and this uh, included 15 different computer vision models, which uh, the competitors wrote solution explanations about how they solved this problem. And then we also did some pretty substantial analysis to see where things worked well, where they didn't, and what, what some of the challenges are for uh, analyzing off Nader imagery. And so, how do we determine how good these algorithms are? And that's kind of the central to these challenges, but it's also central to understanding whether or not you could use them in an actual mapping application. And a lot of the time, people use just pixel-wise metrics to evaluate how good an algorithm is. So if we're looking at this input image on the left here, uh, this is a suburban area in Atlanta. And this is a classic example of what an AI algorithm's output might look like for, for where buildings are in this imagery. So it's just an image with zeros where there's no building, ones where there are buildings. Now, this isn't all that useful if what you want is something like this, you know, vectorized building footprint labels, something that you might actually use in mapping. But a lot of, the, a lot of groups don't really go beyond this. And uh, all of the metrics are, are associated with just these pixel masks for how well the algorithm performs. And this is a problem because you can miss some critical uh, bits of information about how well the algorithm actually worked if that's all you're looking at. For example, if we're looking at this, um, just this image right here, uh, of this is a part of Shanghai, China. There are four buildings here labeled. And we have two different uh, sets of predictions for uh, where buildings are. So these are just toy examples that an algorithm might have generated. Where here you've got you know, all four buildings were found, but it's slightly offset versus here. The algorithm perfectly found three buildings, but missed one of them and then predicted something over here on the left. Both of these sets of predictions are the same by pixel-wise metrics. And this is a problem if you want to be able to distinguish between maybe the footprints being just a little bit offset versus a really substantial uh, misprediction. And so what we use is uh, a whole 
kind of building-wise or, or object-wise uh, identification yeah. algorithm, which is an intersection over union metric. I won't dig into this in too much detail, but it's essentially measuring what fraction of the pixels uh, between one uh, prediction and the, uh, the thing that it overlaps with, the ground truth that it overlaps with, uh, what fraction overlap out of those two. And we set a threshold for the SpaceNet challenges saying half of them have to be overlapping. Uh, pretty much for this to for a building to be called correct, um, and so for this SpaceNet challenge, we bend across uh, different subsets of the you know different look angles, and then calculated an F1 score. And so, how well did algorithms perform in this challenge? And really, what is the limit for how far off Nader uh, can uh, can an image be taken for it to still find build, building footprints? So this is showing the performance across different look angles for the top five participants in the challenge. And what you can see is that out to about 30 degrees off Nader or something like this, algorithms perform pretty consistently, right? Not a lot of change. Uh, but then it really starts to drop precipitously at this point. So you get a 40% drop going uh, all the way out to 54 degrees off Nader. So this is the type of information that we hope uh, people will, will have and will think about when they're trying to consider applying a machine learning algorithm for a mapping application. One other thing that I want to note uh, is that this is, as I said, set with a threshold of 0.5 for the fraction of pixels that have to be overlapping, right? And so this is kind of in between these two toy examples here where on the top you're just barely getting part of the building, on the bottom you got most of it right, although the footprint's still a little bit off. But if you want a really high quality footprint, uh, current state-of-the-art algorithms are still really going to struggle. The best, uh, and this is looking at the performance of the very best algorithm, the fraction of buildings that it got right, uh, as you increase the, the minimum quality threshold. And what you see is that if you're looking for something really good, even the best algorithms right now are not going to be able to get something uh, that, that perfect. And so again, this isn't to say that machine learning is useless for mapping at this point, but it's the kind of information that you want to make sure you know going into trying to apply uh, an AI algorithm for mapping. Um, so yeah, the key takeaways, current state-of-the-art algorithms really struggle um, at over 30 degrees off Nader. Um, and at present, e even, those, uh, even at Nader, the best footprint predictions are still fairly imperfect and would probably require some manual uh, validation. So I'm just going to give a quick um, uh, intro to the challenge that we have currently running for road networks and routing. And so here, uh, what we're providing is imagery like this. And we're providing uh, ro vectorized road network uh, map labels that include not only um, not, not only where the road is, but also an estimate of safe travel speed. And this is extracted, um, it's, it's not the actual speed limit, it's an estimate based on number of lanes, the type of road, the surface, this kind of thing. Um, and so we're including a whole bunch of different cities here. Uh, we're holding back one city because we want participants to develop algorithms that will work not just on the cities that they train on, but also on some on new imagery that they've never seen before, which is currently a major challenge in machine learning. And then finally, we're not just using pixel-wise metrics for this either, and this is something that uh, was alluded to in a couple of the uh, Rhodes talks from Microsoft yesterday, where it's important to not just look at how good the, the map is uh, for, at a pixel-wise level for Rhodes, because if we're comparing, you know, say, this ground truth network and two, these two different sets of predictions here, at a pixel-wise level, the prediction on the right is actually better because the road widths are wrong in, in the middle one, but you're going to lose connectivity and, and actual routing through this. And so it's uh, important to use a metric that uh, gives you some assessment of the quality of a network for routing, not just the pixel-wise accuracy. And so we use something that a colleague of mine, Adam Van Etten, developed, which is called Apple's uh, Applied Path or uh, Average Path Length Similarity uh, for this. And I definitely encourage you to check out this metric if, if you're interested. I'm not going to dig into it right here because it's uh, pretty mathy. Um, and I think I will cut it off there uh, in, for the sake of time. But I would love um, to hear 
thoughts, questions, etc. And uh, we have tons of different uh, avenues where we communicate this type of information that gets a bit more into the weeds. Our blog, uh, the downlink, is probably uh, the best one. Uh, thank you all very much for coming again, and happy to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. What, 35 and then it jumps back up. Like, what is that? Yeah, so it, it, it is interesting, and it's notable that all these algorithms use different model architectures. So even all the different state-of-the-art algorithm uh, architectures work more or less the same. The dip is actually as you, uh, so there were images taken from both sides of the city in this data set. There are some with the sun reflecting straight back at the satellite off of things like building roofs, and there are some where they're occluded in shadow, like in that example I showed. The ones with lower performance are where things are, are masked in shadow. Yeah? Uh, as another metric, could you consider replaying Maria in Puerto Rico? And say, look, if we go back and do that experiment with the algorithms yeah. we had, how many days and what accuracy? That would be, yeah, that would be a great, a great thing to do. We haven't done that, but that would be um, a really interesting way to say how much acceleration can you actually get out of this AI algorithm. Noticed your data sets are mainly urban. Yeah. Only. Uh, like why why urban areas versus not urban? Because those are yeah. Really well mapped. That's a good question. It's mostly because that way we can get a lot of labels in this fairly high density area, um, and you need a lot of labels for machine learning algorithms. Um, although my colleague uh, Daniel Hogan is giving a talk a little bit later today about how much imagery and how many labels you actually need for uh, machine learning. So check that out. Um, there are some pretty low density areas in some of these as well. There are some um, of the, the tiles that we get out of this in Atlanta that have like one building footprint or, or few, a lot of them that actually have none. Um, but it, yeah, exploring how these things work in more rural areas is, would also be great. Yeah, so they all of the data sets had imagery from all of the angles. Okay. Yep, yep. Um, and it was a 50-25-25 split in terms of the, the different chips. Um, but all of the imagery from one geographic tile was held in within one, one um, piece of that data set. So you didn't have like seven degrees for this geography here and eight in this one because that would probably make it a lot easier for the algorithms to learn. Yeah. So uh, I, I enjoyed the, the emphasis on footprint quality and metrics for that. Um, and in many cases, uh, you only need to go so far with quality, depending on the type of inference that might be required. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if, as part of this, based on program challenges, you know, you know out of bounds, uh, behavioral inferences, so inferring what's going on in particular, particular regions based on footprints and metric knowledge, because mm -hmm. it really depends on. Sure, that's that's a great point. It's not something that we've that we've explored, um, and yeah, we're kind of trying to build slowly and incrementally this foundational understanding of how well you can map these things. But it would be great to have people take these data sets or work based off of them and do things like that. Yeah. Are the the labeled data sets are they are they like are they open source? Yes. They Sorry, open? I. I can't believe I didn't mention that. So all of the imagery uh, and all of the labels, except for the held back validation sets that we use uh, to score the challenges, are all freely available on Amazon Web Services. And we've there, there's no cost to download. AWS um, absorbs the download cost as part of their support of the challenge. So I definitely encourage people to download the imagery, the labels, play around with it as much as you'd like. Let us know if you have questions or what you're doing with it. We love to hear that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, have you explored or do you have a suggestion for the best uh, workflow infrastructure to take the predictions from these models and actually use them to accelerate the mapping? 
We have not looked into that directly. That's a, a great thing to explore. Um, and that's, yeah, that's something that we talk a lot about how you would, how you would do this most effectively. It's not something that we've had time to explore yet. All right. Thank you all very much.